morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm Ira Katz Nelson. I teach political science and history at Columbia University, and I'm proud to serve as a deputy director at Columbia World Projects. Uh, a warm welcome to those from many different parts of the globe for our consideration of disaster response and recovery, Beirut, New York, and beyond. This event is sponsored by Columbia World Projects and the Pandemic Response Institute, also at Columbia, together with the Urban Lab at the American University of Beirut. CWP is in its fifth year, a site that advances knowledge to action in the service of tackling major global challenges. With the Urban Lab in Beirut and Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, colleagues catalyzed a series of conversations that led to the writing and publishing of the Rebuilding Beirut Report, motivated, of course, by the horrific explosion in the port of Beirut in August 2020. As we begin, I would like to especially acknowledge the roles played by Bernadette baird -Zars, then a CWP postdoc and now a professor at Rutgers, and Thomas Asher, CWP's Director of Research and Engagement, for their leadership in the research coordination and writing that went into that report. CWP also partners with New York City PRI, a Columbia CUNY partnership, a City University of New York partnership, created at the contact, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic to help prepare New York City for future public health threats, from infectious disease to climate-related health emergencies, by advancing racial equity and elevating New York as a model of public health preparedness. As we have just recently been reminded by the devastating earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, the urgency of successfully protecting, supporting, and involving the people most affected by disasters has never been greater. This webinar will put various examples from Beirut and New York City and elsewhere into a broader perspective on the challenges and opportunities of post-disaster response. It will address how to deliver lasting on the ground improvements that reduce immediate harms, restore communities, livelihoods, health and infrastructure, and ensure that the most affected groups are significantly less vulnerable for the next disaster. And as we proceed, kindly put any questions you might have uh, in Q&A um, in the chat so that we can um, uh, use these questions uh, during the final uh, phase of this webinar. Allow me now to briefly introduce the three speakers. Wafa El Sadr is the director of Columbia World Projects and executive vice president for Columbia Global. She is also the founder and director of ICAP at Columbia University and an international expert in epidemiology and research on the prevention and management of HIV HIV, tuberculosis, and other infectious diseases. Uh, Mona Fawaz is a professor in urban studies and um, planning. Um, uh, sorry, um, uh, Mona Fawaz is a professor in urban studies and planning at the American University of Beirut. She co-founded the Beirut Urban Lab at the American University a regional research center invested in working towards more inclusive, just, and viable cities. Mona is also the director of the Social Justice and the City Research Program based on the Isam Fares Institute of Public Policy at IUB. And finally, Mitch Stripling is the director of the New York City Pandemic Response Institute, PRI, created to support New York City agencies, organizations, and communities to prevent, prepare, and respond to and recover from major public health emergencies. Mitch has a long history of leadership roles in emergency management, 
disaster response and planning, coordination and response to public health crises. Immediately before joining PRI, served as the National Director for Emergency Preparedness and Response at Planned uh, Parenthood. In a moment, WAFA will provide us with an overview of the ways in which disaster response and recovery efforts have been evolving in light of recent developments. Her remarks will be followed by overviews of the Beirut and PRI work by Mona and Mitch by a collective conversation and, and then questions from those of you who've joined the webinar. On to Wafa, please. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today um, and um, to say a few words before we get to our, really our star speakers for this webinar. For starters, I think that we all recognize that undoubtedly uh, our future is going to be uh, characterized by, uh, by more and more frequent emergencies. And it's uh, this, we know this because of uh, some of the issues that are happening around the world. Clearly the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the vulnerability to infectious diseases, to viruses and to pandemics um, overall. Um, as well as, of course, um, uh, other uh, emergencies that, that are uh, being reported on an almost daily basis, whether they include climate-related emergencies or, for example, earthquakes and, and other emergencies. We also know that there are going to be uh, a lot of urgencies that we also uh, will, uh, will have to respond to, and these include crises of displacements and, and uh, and conflict and so on around the world. All of these point to uh, the need for us to think differently in terms of how can we better predict, better prepare, better respond, and more rapidly and equitably recover from these emergencies. I know that uh, COVID-19 is obviously, I'm an infectious disease person, so it's the closest to my heart and, uh, and other infectious disease. So I wanted to share with you a couple of uh, slides very quickly. Uh, for some, uh, to give you some ideas as to what we should be thinking of. Uh, I think it should be this one. So I, many, uh, several years ago, there was a, a global, health, um, um, uh, global health security index that was developed. And the purpose of that index was to try to gauge the preparedness of different countries in terms of responding to a global health security threat could be again uh, of any nature. And there were several domains that were included in that index, including, uh, you know, prepare, including issues around prevention, uh, the status of detection and reporting, rapid response, uh, the health system preparedness, as well as the compliance with international norms, and also the risk environment uh, in, in each specific country, particularly with regard to biological threats, like for example, viruses or pandemics. And based on that index in 2019, there was an assessment, a global assessment that was made. And in this map here, you'll see uh, in, the, in yellow are the countries that uh, were judged based on that index to be the best prepared, the most prepared. In the orange were more prepared, and then in the red color were least prepared. And uh, you, in a glance, you'll of course notice that the, the United States and several other countries in, West, in Western Europe and, and also Australia and uh, a few other countries in Southeast Asia were considered to be the best or the most prepared to respond to a global health, um, a global health threat. Also importantly, that the, this, uh, this survey showed that at least 75% of the countries received low scores in terms of their preparedness overall. Now the 2019 Global Health Security Index, uh, based on these metrics, uh, uh, what it showed is that actually the United States was the best prepared country. It was the first out of 195 countries in terms of these various metrics that were put in place to measure uh, a country's preparedness. Of course, what we've learned uh, from COVID-19 that just came around a few months thereafter in 2020 is clearly the United States was not well prepared. And I think this made us uh, reflect on what are the metrics in terms of uh, measuring how a community, how a country, how a region can be uh, well prepared to uh, respond to a global health threat or a global uh, threat of any kind. 
And why was that the United States not uh, did, why did the United States do so poorly? And I think a couple of reasons are uh, because of the lack of universal healthcare access and also because of the lack of a public confidence in the government. And the other lesson learned from these evaluation criteria is that these did not take into account very important parameters, the importance of political will, political leadership, importance of trust in the government, and also the importance of the speed of the response. So based on this, uh, we developed at ICAP actually, and this is a framework we're also utilizing in PRI, a conceptual framework for how to move, how moving forward, how can there be a comprehensive framework as we think of these global threats that we're gonna undoubtedly face. And I think it starts with, of course, the preparation, which is very important to improve preparation, both for known and unknown threats, to strengthen prediction, and that's really important in terms of being cognizant of having a high quality data in terms of risk factors and predictive modeling. The importance of scaling up of prevention uh, of these uh, threats overall, whether they be biological or climate threats or other threats. The importance of enhanced detection of these threats. The importance of minimizing uh, the response time. And of course, the importance of calibrating uh, the response overall uh, with the goal, of course, of having an equitable and comprehensive response. So with these few introductory remarks, uh, I'm gonna move, move the conversation to then uh, have Amona tell us about uh, the Beirut um, report and the work that she's done uh, in collaboration with the Beirut Urban Laboratories. Mona. Thank you, thank you, Rafa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for organizing this, the Columbia World Project team. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here today with everyone. Um, so um, I am uh, very, very pleased and proud to present today uh, the report, uh, Recovering Beirut, that uh, the Beirut Urban Lab, the research center where I work at the American University of Beirut co-published with a Columbia World Project with the help of numerous heroes there. Um, I am gonna start by taking you first to um, Beirut and to that moment of uh, the blast with these pictures that have uh, become really uh, known globally, uh, the exploded clear, the wheat silos, uh, the country's uh, main wheat uh, reserve blown up, but also uh, more than 200 people dead, over 5,000 injured, that's in the first days, and uh, more than 130,000 houses affected. In fact, 2,750 metric tons of improperly stored ammonium nitrate, um, callous governance, an accident that should never happen, a portrait in the middle of the city it was very much uh, an unusual event, kind of what we see with the current earthquake, for example. The point is that when we see more and more events like this, there's something that becomes really important to consider, I think. As city planners, and I am one, we um, are trained to think that there is a public authority that will come in, become the custodian of a common good, work uh, in synergies with local communities to recover, and that that incident will be sort of a big moment in the life of a community that would slowly recover. The problem is, uh, just like Aleppo today and Beirut in uh, a few, uh, a couple of years ago, these big events happen while other crises are unfolding. When the Beirut port explosion happened in, uh, 20, in August 2020, uh, Lebanon was uh, also uh, severely suffering from the COVID crisis. But it was also suffering from a severe political crisis, vacancy in leadership, and an unfolding financial meltdown that continues to remain today the case. So, um, so we need to think of this post-disaster recovery very much in a context of unfolding, overlapping multiple crises, and to think that this is not unusual and that it's happening in contexts where uh, governments are not keen on helping the cities um, and where they don't act as the custodians of the common good, but also where citizens are not necessarily like a coherent collective. And these pose important questions about what can we then uh, do? 
Um, so this is just to give you an idea of the mapping that was done in partnership with the Order of Engineers and Architects in Nehru and uh, other colleagues in universities that showed the uh, blast here and the disaster in the city. And you can see some of the pictures in the aftermath of the blast, the main electricity building to the right, severely hurt, uh, every, the infrastructure damaged, but also people's homes. Uh, neighborhoods that have really suffered. And it was really at that time that um, Tom Asher uh, reached out with colleagues also at Columbia, Heba Boakar particularly saying, how can we help? What can we do in a context like this? What can we offer uh, to help? And it was a question we were asking ourselves. We are ultimately a research center. We are scholars, we are professors of city planning. Uh, we were, of course, at that point, citizens uh, involved on the street, but we wanted to think about ways in which we could bring our knowledge and our capabilities uh, into action. And so together we conceived the series of six meetings that brought together some 120 experts. And one of the originalities was to really bring people from words that don't talk to each other. So there was the geographies, there were people, there were uh, participants, uh, as you see here from Chile, having worked in the post-earthquake uh, recovery, Barreau Prince in Haiti, uh, but, uh, but also from Afghanistan, Iraq, Baghdad, Beirut, Nigeria, the United States, Europe, and many more places. They came from everywhere, but also they came from different professional sectors. So we had public sector actors, we had academics, we had non-governmental uh, uh, actors, uh, people who work in international NGOs, in international organizations. And what this allowed is a very rich um, conversation that built on uh, these multiple experiences. And to build on them what we conceived of six sessions, that you will see in the report itself. So some of the sessions were focused on a specific topic. So it was, for example, the port or heritage preservation or housing. Other sessions were actually focused on processes. So we talked about governance, about activating space. And each session was designed in a way that um, basically starts with a brief that was shared at least a week ahead with participants that explained very well the context of the uh, that we were discussing in Lebanon and finished with three or four key questions that we wanted answered in these discussions. Um, the report follows the same structure. It, uh, and I hope you'll see it because it, it is very rich. It basically brings every one of those lessons and it every one of those sessions and sort of follows the same structure of a summary, synthetic four questions, and some of the main points that were raised during the, the sessions. Um, who, who would read something like, like this? That's, I think, a question that we were just discussing before the seminar that would be nice to take on again. Um, do we expect that the fabulous lessons that are here are going to be taken on by public decision makers in Lebanon naturally because they make sense, because they represent the consolidation of an amazing experience, uh, I doubt. Uh, and I think people who live in today in Naira and Afghanistan and Syria and Turkey and many other places in the region and beyond will have the same reaction. Rather, I think that this is a very good people, place for people to start if you want to be involved in a context of a disaster, whether you're a scholar or a well-meaning specific individual in, public, in the public sector um, or perhaps uh, in an NGO. Uh, that you will find very good points to start, questions to be raised that can really offer pathways for uh, um, cautionary points, but also pathways for more inclusive uh, recoveries. Um, I don't have time to go through the report. I'm just going to point out to four main points that come out that uh, we feel were the main points. Forward. There's many more details and illustrations in the report. The first one is that usually when an event like this happens, people are very, very angry with public authorities. In Beirut, it was the callous governance of the poor that meant that ammonium nitrate can be stored right outside people's homes and affect them in the way it did. And immediately after, activists began to write on walls, my government did this. Um, 
And that's the same sentiment you're seeing today in Turkey, and you would have heard it in Syria had there been a little bit more uh, news coverage and freedom of speech. It's a, we also heard it, of course, in Katrina in the United States. It's people feeling a sense that the government is directly responsible and consequently it's custody over the recovery process. Its legitimacy is questioned. And what everyone converged on is the fact that that needs to be changed, that we need to invent a story, a narrative for a recovery that brings people together, that recognizes the harm done, and perhaps designs institutional scaffoldings for the recovery that fall back elements of the state, foster synergies between public and private and nonprofit actors, um, and introduce the mechanisms that create transparency, uh, provide information and accountability. Uh, one idea, for example, that I recall vividly is the idea of an information clearing house, a way in which uh, people can learn what is happening. Uh, another very important point is to embed meaningful community engagement across all aspects of planning and implementation. Immediately after the blast, you see a lot of individuals who want to make a difference. So these can be professionals. Uh, this is a meeting in the urban lab to the right, but it can also be people on the street. It can be activists taking on public spaces and using the opportunity to turn a parking into a garden. Uh, whatever it is that community engagement is a fantastic energy that needs to be uh, used, supported, um, and ideally scaled up. The third point is to be really careful that disasters tend to exacerbate inequalities. We've seen it almost anywhere where there's been a disaster. Disasters affect mostly people who uh, are more vulnerable because they live in worse houses, because they have a smaller margin of intervention. And usually post-disaster recovery come to exacerbate these differences. Uh, Typically, people will be at work, will not be able to receive aid and uh, respond to surveys, and often they end up being excluded. A lot of the uh, questions that were raised during a lot of the lessons came from looking for explicit ways of supporting these vulnerable communities, including um, when in these moments of exception, some of the forces that work against vulnerable communities, the criminalization of uh, the labor of refugees or migrants, for example, uh, crisis may create or the disaster may create a moment in which these are lift, uh, public restrictions are lifted. And it would be good to think about how to capitalize and turn these into long-term gains. And finally, pending on the ground, Organizations of uh, society or civil groups. And that, it, that again is very important because people get engaged in the beginning, but if there's not enough wins, if you don't show elements of what you do, uh, then uh, this engagement happens very quickly. And one of the important points of public engagement in Beirut was that activists, civil society was very interested in fixing, repairing public staircases, public squares, places where people gather. And these are very important and often neglected because the focus of the humanitarian is usually on individual homes. So spending that money and that coordination to recover a sense of a collective is very, very important. I don't have time to do justice to this report, uh, but these are some of the main takers and I hope you'll check the document itself. It's available online. Okay. Thank you so much, Mona. And uh, on to Mitch now, please. Thanks so much, Ira and Mona and everyone for the time and also for a really beautiful report that's a reflection in all the best possibilities we can see in, in the tragedies of disaster reconstruction. New York City is a much different context than Beirut. Uh, COVID was a much different kind of disaster than this explosion. You know, you can see here an image from uh, March of 2020. And what's striking in comparison to the pictures Mona showed of Beirut is, is how invisible the damage is, right? The, the damage was hitting our social structure, it was taking our lives, but the infrastructure remained intact. The thing that these ideas share, though, is the conception that these disasters, we have to stop treating them as if they are natural, as if they are some, coming from somewhere external. Um, and there was a question coming in through the Q&A about, about how we, we treat the inequities that are in the topography of, of our uh, situation of our societies. 
And what we know is that the disasters exist in the underlying inequities that we live with every day. They're sort of there lurking. They're lurking in these uh, the idea of, of too much poverty. They're lurking in the underlying inequities that we live with. And then when an external event comes, the harm that comes is based not just in, in that event, whether it's a, a pandemic or an explosion. It's based in the underlying structures of discrimination that were there in the society before. And so it's incumbent on us to not treat these disasters as one-time crises, right, to address just the harm that's caused on that day but to improve the underlying function of society so that we can respond to them better um, over time. That's what the conceptual model Waffle was talking about is getting to this idea that we have to calibrate how our society functions because we no longer live in a world where we can think of uh, a disaster as a one-time occurrence. Um, we dealt with an explosion in Beirut. The city recovered from that and moved back to normality. If that world ever existed, it it's past us now. We're living in what Yarmar Bonilla, a, a thinker on Puerto Rican disaster, calls a disaster swarm, a kind of uh, a system of crises that happen over and over again before we can fully recover. And that means that we have to think in a different way about disasters. So the New York City Pandemic Response Institute, I want to talk about as a way that, that New York City is trying to adjust to this new reality. It was founded and supported by a New York City government led by ICAP uh, here at Columbia University with our key partner, the CUNY School of Public Health and Health Policy, as a robust coalition to address some of the findings that we see in, uh, in the report that Mona talked about. First, it is directly focused on improving New York City's societal response. As one example, we're writing a, our own report about the COVID-19 impact and response in New York City, not just about the governmental response, but about how all of society came together, how civil society functioned, how businesses functioned, how government functioned all together to, uh, to respond and recover. In doing that, we're hoping to address something that the report makes clear about how you use disaster reconstruction to improve the ongoing governance of a system or a city. We're also building the Pandemic Response Institute as a great coalition, a big tent set of groups that are invested in the social response for the city. We have a governing board that will include city agencies, as well as community partners, as well as business leaders, an advisory council that will have 30 members from across New York City society coming together to wrestle with some of the big questions that the report on the Beirut explosion raises in the New York City context, right? How do we design for high community engagement? How do we make sure that stakeholders have a voice when their communities are impacted by disasters? And within that, we have seven faculty-led teams led by faculty at Columbia or the City University of New York who are working on the ground to address these issues. The idea of a structure like the Pandemic Response Institute is, is not something like a think tank. We're not just meant to be coming up with policy solutions. Instead, we want to make sure that we're working neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, across all of the five boroughs in New York City to address these issues in hyper-local ways in partnership with the people who are most effective. That is working hand-in-hand -hand with those who are most marginalized in the city to make sure that their vision gets integrated into holistic disaster response. And we want to do that in ways that we can help New York City to become a model for other cities around the world who are dealing with this disaster storm, who are living in this reality of getting hit by crisis after crisis after crisis and needing to find new ways to adjust and repair when those things happen. Obviously, these contexts are very different. I'm not a scholar on Lebanon. I'm not a scholar on Turkey, but we see in disasters similar um, ideas that, that can be used to promote healing and to promote better uh, governance and adaptability in these systems in the future. In talking about that, I, I wanna hit two points about the Beirut it's, report itself and what we can learn from disasters in terms of how these lessons can be implemented. You know, you heard that from Mona, that's something that's in the report itself. The report offers a lot of strong policy thinking, but there's a question there. Who will take up that thinking? Who will help that thinking to change the underlying structures of inequity that we're all wrestling with? And I, I want to offer a couple of things. As I noted, you know, in Lebanon, just like everywhere else, the crisis really came before the crisis, right? There was 
ongoing uh, debt issues, governance issues, issues with poverty within the context of Lebanon before this uh, explosion ever happened. And those structures directly led to the crisis, right? Those structures created the environment that, that, that built this kind of social ecological system where those explosives were allowed to be there, where they were allowed to cause harm. Um, and so when addressing it, we need to go back and look at how do we get to those underlying structures of power, how we change them. Uh, what you're seeing in front of you is a graphic that comes from uh, uh, the University of Miami in the American context. It, it's a product of 30 or 40 years of sociological research on disasters. And what you see is the way that the impact of a disaster leads to this heroic period where civil society groups come together. We saw that in Beirut. Um, people came to save their neighbors, they came to serve food, they came to create shelter. And it's followed by this process of disillusionment when the community realizes that that um, the government or the international NGO community that they relied on are not going to come in and save them, that there are not enough resources to make these changes. There's maybe a not enough political will. And so the community itself has to reckon with building a reconstruction process on its own. And I want to offer three things that are different between a pandemic context and an explosive context that might help. They might help with this question of how do we actually make sure solutions like those in the report happen in the world? So when a disaster happens, it creates physical solidarity between these groups. These civil society groups that came together, they create a DNA, an infrastructure of solidarity that exists and can be used for policy change. The visible destruction in Beirut also serves as a reminder that can energize underlying cultural change. And that's particularly prominent on uh, at times like uh, an anniversary uh, of the event or a celebration or something like the release of this report. Those things together can create cultural energy to help the change in the report see the light of day. But, and this is the last thing I'll say, it's important to be realistic about the power of, of a report like this and what it can do in the world. Me, having lived through a, maybe more than two dozen disasters in various contexts, what I want to offer is it's so important that this report creates a better vision going forward, that the work has been done because now it exists. And the next disaster that happens in our swarm, it's there to be inserted. The thinking in the report can go into the Turkish context, as Ira was was saying before, it can be used for the next crisis situation that happens in Lebanon, which we know is not far off. And I'll just close with a little story about that. Um, many people might know about the 1985 Mexico City earthquake, which also left 300,000 people homeless, similar to the amount that were left homeless after the Beirut explosion. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that a year before that earthquake, uh, there was a chemical plant explosion, uh, a similar situation based on negligence that happened in Beirut. That chemical plant explosion created a lot of thinking, a lot of analysis about how the government can do better. It created a lot of reports. Those problems were not necessarily fixed by those reports, but that thinking was there when the earthquake happened and it was able to be used and civil society was able to rise up and, and really push for and enact change in the way that Mexico was governed because they had the underlying findings from the report and they had this kind of energy and solidarity that was uh, created by the disaster. So I wanna leave with this idea that in a disaster swarm, in this kind of new society that we're all dealing with, where we don't have time to recover from one hit before the next happens, having this thinking in hand and putting into it into new structures like the Pandemic Response Institute creates a new way for disasters to not, not address these things as one-time crises, but to use the energy of these impacts to really help to fix some of the underlying inequities that we all wrestle with in society every day. Um, thanks so much, Ira. Thank you so much, Mitch and Mona. And let's proceed uh, to discussion uh, based on questions which uh, have already been coming in. Um, uh, I'm going to begin with um, uh, a question about the um, similarities and differences across types of disaster. Um, as already noted, um, the pandemic, the COVID-19 and Beirut, uh, although they share uh, uh, features, also have dramatic differences. Um, uh, Beirut explosion was um, sudden, 
um, one has to say, although it might have been expected, it wasn't expected. Um, and the scale of it was um, uh, instantaneous and astonishing. Um, COVID-19 um, was a protracted event. Um, uh, it began um, slowly, shockingly, but slowly, and had has had ebbs and flows, and of course has not yet uh, is not yet gone. Um, uh, how how should we think and compare recovery from acute events um, like the the recent uh, terrible earthquakes um, and the explosion uh, as opposed to long um, uh, crises, as it were, uh, where we may know something of the beginning, but we don't always know whether we're in the middle or the end. Um, reflections would be most welcome, uh, Mona and Mitch. So, Mona, start with you. Sure. Uh, thanks. That's that's a great question. I think um, what I want to say in relation to this is that uh, whether and how acute events and small unfolding events. Um, how they affect people is essentially defined by how well we're governed and what kind of structures of society do we actually have. So when you have a structure of governance in which uh, cities have some sense of uh, a resiliency plan, for example, or some trust in public authority so that uh, there are um, that some collaboration can happen or when uh, individuals identify as a collective, then the response to the crisis, I think, becomes uh, much easier. Of course, crises will then each have to uh, require a different kind of setup and response and pandemics uh, will unfold also very differently, whether you're in a context like Lebanon where public authorities were facing a lot of political protests at the time of the uh, unfolding of COVID. So they responded with a full shutdown of the city very quickly and created sort of a huge emergency. And that's very different from a context like the US where the response was quite delayed and slow and, and more, um, more learned. Uh, but I guess what I'm trying to say ultimately is that uh, we should focus more on what is there at the time, or at least to me, what is really important is what is there at the time the crisis happens, um, what exists in terms of state society relations, structures of governance, public institutions, uh, because this will help us predict much better what kind of recovery we can actually expect. And, and I remind you that they all came at the same time in many cities, not only in Beirut. So it's not that one came and then the, uh, the other, which ultimately makes it a, a crisis in governance more and government more than anything else. Yeah, before least. turning to Mitch, let me observe that our colleague at Columbia, Adam Tooze, has been using the term poly crisis um, because often the emergence of a uh, disastrous circumstance, whether immediate or long-term comes in the midst of other forms of uh, crises, confidence, uh, credibility of authority and the like. And um, that makes, of course, more complicated um, any response. Disasters are never isolated from context, history, situation, uh, circumstance. Uh, Mitch. Yeah, I think that that point about context is really the key. You know, there's a real temptation in in a short term event. You know, you asked the distinction between short and long term. A short term event to really focus on the crisis at the expense of the underlying structural factors. We see that happen in in all kinds of contexts because focusing on the crises, there's a sense of spectacle almost. There's a sense of you get political capital for it. It, it creates all of these these visuals about the tragedy that 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 speak to political competence. And by focusing on that, it becomes a blinder where none of the underlying issues that actually cause the, the disaster get addressed. So there's a sense in a short-term disaster that that you it, it's kind of a fake out, right? You can you can seem like you're responding to something without actually doing good for the community because of the, the more visual nature of what's happening. On the other hand, with a long-term event, one of the issues that is that you have enough time 
time for the initial solidarity of the response to dissipate. And that's why in COVID, we see disinformation campaigns, we see um, all of the fights become baked into the cultural uh, milieu. And the issue there is that in a disaster, once you lose that initial community solidarity that you have, you start to run out of policy options. This is one reason pandemics are often not remembered as well as explosions. If you look at the historical record, even though they kill more people, because by the time they end, they've become part of the normal fabric of inequity in the society. And therefore, they're not they're not remembered as clearly. And and so therefore, it's incumbent in a long term emergency to really keep building that community solidarity intentionally over time um, to, to sort of try and keep that policy window open as long as you can. Now, in um, a question about um, government and the state, um, the um, uh, this is uh, dear to me as a political scientist. Um, uh, Mona, you began by uh, mentioning expectations of the state and even the absence of the state. Um, and uh, we could think of other examples um, where uh, on the other end of the spectrum, where states are not only incredibly strong, but often um, have repressed or downgraded civil society. Um, how should we think about this spectrum of political and state um, importance and situation in dealing with disasters? When is, as it were, public authority too weak and when is public authority um, too strong? And can you both uh, think of um, examples or offer examples of uh, governmental state action that um, show promise um, for um, moving us toward more efficacious and equitable ways of, of working? Um, it's not a it's not a sm small question that's been posed um, uh, uh, for us. Uh, Mitch, do you want to start this time? Yeah, and let me do kind of a positive and a negative on that question. You know, I, I think that one of the the pitfalls of this this idea of, of focusing on a crisis, of crisis epistemology, thinking about these things as a short, sudden shock is that you get a militarized or paramilitary response to them. And we saw that in the United States context to COVID, where uh, the response did things like deploying naval ships to New York City to try and treat patients instead of, of maybe investing in local neighborhood pharmacies or clinics to, to do that sort of work. A positive example would be later in the response. We saw learning. We saw a lot of policy learning. And the governmental structures learned to to sort of take funding and inject it into community health worker models that understood their community. So we saw things like test distribution that went door to door where neighbors were calling on their neighbors um, to get out COVID tests, to get out COVID vaccine, vaccine distribution. That was funded by the state. It was invested with the authority of the state, but it was carried out by people who were trusted by their friends and colleagues and neighbors. And that ultimately, I think, made it more effective. So I think that's a good pairing, right? If government can find ways to support this stuff, but from a back a back seat a little bit where they're not the face of the response, that can often be better for certain communities, especially those with less trust. Mona? Um, yeah, so I mean, in, in, in Lebanon, if we, uh, if we look at the kind of public response that we saw uh, to the pandemic and then to the post port blast, but also prior to that, to the Syrian refugee crisis in the country, because in the 10 years before the Beirut port blast, Lebanon had received about a million or a million and a half Syrian refugees, something like 20% of its population. The national response has been to uh, have the state retreat, repress, and not and criminalize the presence or say that it's not playing a role. And what has happened is that the delegation of the governance of forced population displacement then went to international non-governmental organizations. And we were just discussing the fact that INGOs are not the state and they are not civil society. They create their own structures, their own institutions. And when the port blast happened, 
It was these international organizations that actually transposed the same relief structure that they were using for refugee response to Beirut and try to deploy it in a shelter response to recover people's homes. The outcome is even further weakening of any local authority and strengthening of this tendency of uh, NGOizing decision making. There is nothing where NGOs are more democratic, more accountable, uh, more representative than state institutions. And the other very big challenge that we increasingly saw is that there is no long-term commitment to a place through the involvement of the humanitarian relief. So ultimately, the weak state created a situation where, um, where not, only, not only it delegated authority over the recovery, but it also itself weakened its own presence, its institutions, and allowed for the space to be occupied by someone else. Uh, what, what I think we retained from what I think we retained from this is the fact that when you Conversely, went down to the street and asked people, who did you look for when the explosion happened? They were trying to find pieces of the state. They were going to the firefighters, the public hospital, uh, the local police station, any kind of public institution that they knew for a very long time. And what we've seen over time now, two years after the blast, is that a lot of um, is that while in general the state is increasingly weaker, increasingly absent, and that that happens in sync with the strengthening of other actors, including humanitarian bodies, we have seen emerge a number of small public heroes, uh, a director general, someone in a municipality who wants to play a role. And so our role as a research center, as activists, as, as involved citizens has been to try and weave the conversation, to connect individuals across different places and create back a little bit of synergy between the public and citizens. And I think that that for me has been a very uh, important success story in the sense that we are, uh, we are recovering uh, some of the uh, aspects of that, of what we need from a state, which is this custody over the shared spaces. Thanks. Um, we have a, a, a question from a member of an international NGO in Turkey, um, and um, which goes to the heart of what um, each of the organizations represented here, uh, PRI, the Urban Lab, Columbia World Projects, seeks to do in connecting uh, thinking, rigorous thinking, with doing, um, with practice, with affecting um, outcomes. And the question um, asked by uh, a colleague in Turkey um, uh, is the following, um, and I'm quoting, in reality, have decision makers taken the suggestions in the rebuilding Beirut report seriously? Of course, it may be too early to know because the report has just recently been published both in Arabic and English, um, uh, but more broadly, um, the question is, how can those of us who work primarily in an academic setting, uh, but who wish to um, help shape and influence um, decisions and circumstances on the ground, how can we best proceed to, um, to make the knowledge we produce become what might be called policy knowledge, uh, knowledge that actually guides and shapes um, action. Uh, so we'll begin with you, Mona, as the question was um, uh, starts with the Rebuilding Beirut report, but in fact, it's a, a broader question as well. I'll, I'll be brief. I'll just say, look for an ecosystem of change. As academics, we do something well. We, uh, we know how to research. We know how to create productive, deliberative processes. Uh, we know how to bring precedents, uh, and that's what we can bring to the table. We also know how to gather data, how to create, and, and data is, uh, in contexts such as mine, at least a major reason why people want to collaborate with me, including public sector actors. So think of that place in an ecosystem of change, and then think about who are the other actors that you need to create synergies with, where are they located, and how can one begin to 
forge that network of change that can allow for some of the lessons in the report to unfold. They, they won't unfold on their own. No one will pick up a report and say, oh, that's a great idea. I had never read it before, but it can inspire and um, it can begin to provide pathways or infrastructures for uh, unfolding uh, some kind of change. And I think it has plenty of very good recommendations that can work in that direction. So um, uh, network building is, is critical from this perspective. Uh, Mitch? I think that, you know, one thing it's so important to understand is, is the fractal nature of the ecosystem that Mona's talking about. Fractal meaning that small and large, we're, we're kind of repeating some of the same structures and missions and the scales are nested within each other. If you're out there and I'm seeing some of the such great questions in the Q&A, I don't think we're going to get to, but a neighborhood or a hyper-local environment, if you within your neighborhood context, then I'm talking about block groups, I'm talking about neighborhood book groups, even I'm talking about um, parent and teacher associations on education. If you can think about how to involve some of these practices at that hyper local level and create a vision for how you might recover from a disaster um, uh, in your neighborhood. In emergencies, those things tend to scale up. That is, if you can create a workable model in the location that you are, that model, when crises hits, you'll suddenly find that it's it's spreading out to other neighborhoods because people are so desperate to know what to do at those times of crises. And so what that means if you're an academic or if you're a nonprofit is, and this is hard, you know, people in the international NGO community or the academic community often want to present themselves as in solidarity to civil society in a given disaster zone. And, and hopefully they are, but they're not the same. Civil society in a location that's hit by a disaster is very different than the international aid community or the academic community that's trying to help them. And so our job from the outside is to support those hyper-local visions to resource them and help them grow, but not to take them over. And so the more we can figure out how to, it's almost like gardening, find these great models that exist in local neighborhoods and resource them so they can help scale and spread. That, that's really what the job is. And that's why I think at this fractal level, even if you can make change in one school, neighborhood or block, that change will spread and help a wide, uh, a wide variety of contexts when a disaster occurs. We have a, a very interesting question, which is focused on New York City, but also has a wider um, importance. Um, I'll, I'll read the question. Do you agree that New York City seems to have a high risk tolerance, that it focuses more on recovery and not preparation from withstanding Hurricane Sandy to persevering through 9-11? The sense is that New York City can or should focus more on response rather than readiness. Um, now, this is a question both about the, the, the actual situation, uh, but also what our, your perspective should be on the balance between um, uh, preparation and um, recovery. Um, uh, Mitch, it's a New York focused question, but then we'll go to Mona as well. <laughs> Um, you know, first, it's important to understand there are some problems with the preparedness model. In the 1950s, the United States had a lot of civil defense work. As part of that, there was a plan to evacuate New York City in the event of a nuclear explosion. It was a completely unworkable plan. It was unrealistic. It was designed to give people comfort that they were prepared without actually preparing them. There's a sociologist named Lee Clark who calls uh, plans like that um, uh, uh, works of imagination, right? They, they aren't actually meant to help you respond. They're just meant to help like the community feel better about itself. And so what I would say is that the problem you're talking about of risk tolerance is not just a New York problem, not just a United States problem. It's a global problem that we're dealing with. And that risk tolerance is there because we value some human lives more than other human lives in, in this world. That's just a, it's kind of a plain fact. And so for me, Part of the issue is certainly preparedness. We want to invest, especially in structural mitigation. We want to invest in community functioning. But I think that the issue is really about what Mona opened this whole webinar with, which is it's about how we invest in the underlying and ongoing crises and improve how we govern ourselves and how we adapt more than it is about preparing for any particular crises that happen. If we can resource that, 
we'll start changing this underlying valuation of human lives. And that's what's going to create more health and flourishing in the long term, more than more than writing a plan for a particular kind of event. Mona? Yeah, I absolutely agree. When the port blast happened, Beirut had just finished, uh, just, just finished a two-year study, $2 million funded by the World Bank, a city resiliency plan. You know what the city authorities did? After one week, the first move was to distribute brooms to activists who were already collecting rubble to help them in their work. Um, when you create a big document with big consultants abroad and it doesn't work, you need things to be owned locally. And so I fully agree. It's really about building the fabric of society in vertical and horizontal synergies so that we are better prepared, but also that we prevent more of these disasters from happening. Um, we have time, I think, just for one last. And this is, a, a, we have just two or three minutes. And the the, the, the question concerns um, healing and forgetting as well as remembering. Um, uh, how, uh, which crises do we wish to have remained front and center for a long time? And, uh, and, and if you think about war or civil war, uh, uh, forgetting is sometimes as important as remembering and keeping um, crises alive. Um, uh, with respect to disaster, the same. Um, how sh how should we? How do you think, um, uh, in in your closing thoughts here about this balance between um, remembering and forgetting? Um, I, I think you can only forget once you secure accountability. Uh, in my country, we have a very long experience of forgiving without any process of accountability, without any process of bringing justice. Uh, this happened at the end of the Civil War. This happened in many of the massacres that were perpetrated during the Civil War, and this continues to happen. Over the last two years, our national government has blocked every single investigation, blocked the work of the judiciary in rendering people accountable. And what this does is it creates a sense of resentment. It's also tried to uh, destroy the silos that many people in the city see as this physical embodiment of this explosion and that they would like to turn into a memorial. So I am all for being able to put big crisis behind us, but if we want to prevent more and more of these happening every day, there needs to be a process of accountability. This is a very widespread popular demand and I feel very, very strongly about it. So I think uh, the term in all of this is really uh, accountability, bringing first uh, a sense of justice for people and then uh, thinking about how collectively we can uh, remember and put this behind us. And Mitch? Let, let me just, yeah, I think that even when that accountability seems impossible, you've got to hold on to the memory. You've got to live with the wound. Uh, you know, it seems like forgetting would bring peace, but it, it the wounds that are there will lead to accountability sometimes in a future disaster. Because, because the second disaster you go to, the third, when you go into it with that, this has happened before, that will then will generate more energy, right? So you don't ever want to forget or lose the wounds from a disaster because those wounds are part of what gives your society energy to try to do better when the next one happens. And, and that's sad, but it's something I think we've got to hold on to during this time. So we, we, we are at time. Um, uh, I, I apologize to the really many uh, questioners, people who pose questions we haven't gotten to, um, but this has been a, a, a bracing and thoughtful uh, conversation. Special thanks uh, to Mona and Mitch and to Wafa, uh, also again to um, uh, Bernadette and uh, Tom um, and others who played a lead role in um, making um, not just this event happened, making the Beirut happen, uh, leading the response to COVID-19, um, which of course Wafa has done at, at our university uh, so ably. Um, and the, the, the theme that, or the themes that we have pursued um, will, um, alas, be with us um, uh, 
in both predictable and unpredictable ways uh, for some time to come. It's wonderful to have um, colleagues around the globe join together in this conversation. And um, I know my colleagues and I here at the university look forward uh, to continuing these relationships. Thank you all for being here today. Um, thank you for this event and um, to be continued. Um, all the best. Cheers. Bye-bye.